Well, thank you all for being with us today um, to, for our, what is, we couldn't figure out how many hundreds of sessions we've done so far in our webinar series, um, but we figured we have now passed a, a full year of Zoo Advisors webinars that I think have helped brought together our community. Uh, I know our team has really benefited from being able to see you, even if we can't share a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or a zoo or aquarium tour with you. So thank you for making it through the year with us. We really appreciate this. Uh, today's session is a little bit different take, six liters, 60 minutes, 60 lessons. We're gonna do a lightning round um, of lessons, of tips and takeaways that I hope will help you on your, your path wherever you are. And just a quick logistics, if you do have thoughts or suggestions, we won't have a lot of time at the end, but please add your thoughts, add your tips in the chat room. So we make sure we capture your ideas or your questions and we can address those at a future date. So if we don't have time at the end, we promise we'll come back to you via the chat room. I just wanted to um, say a word and then I'll introduce our panel. Uh, we're all leaders in some way, shape or form. We may not be the CEO of our organization, but each of us is a leader in our own way, whether it's with our, our team at work, whether it's with a, a church fellowship or a scout troop, we're all somewhere on this leadership path. So I think our, our panelists comments today can really address our concerns and our issues, our interests, wherever we are. We picked to get, put together a panel with a diverse background. Um, some are veterans in their field, some have been in their positions a while, and at least one of you is, what, two days old, I think, in your, your new assignment. Um, they've all contributed to the field of zoo and aquarium leadership, so we are delighted to just move on to our panel. I'll do a brief introduction and then I'll turn it over to them. First of all, we are delighted to, uh, to welcome Nick DeHasia from Oakland Zoo, Sherry Harisney, Oregon, Becky DeWitz. You'll notice some people have changed their place here in recent months. So we're really glad to have them with us and hear their, their recent journey. Uh, Gary Sedol, Aquarium of Niagara, Lori Perkins, Birmingham Zoo, and also I might add Zoo Advisors of Council, thank you, Lori, and Carrie Lewis from the Oregon Coast Aquarium. I'd also like to thank our colleagues, our Zoo Advisor colleagues for being on the call today. Um, I saw Jackie in the room. I, uh, Zach certainly has helped with this. We mentioned Lori, uh, Kathy Yoon is with us, and I think Eric. So. We're delighted, and I'm just gonna turn things right over to Nick. So Nick, take it away and thank you. Yeah, hi, Ed. thank you. And thanks Kathy and David for putting this together. Um, you're right, I, I am four days into my new role as a CEO here in Oakland. And it's good to see a lot of friends and colleagues and especially my ELDP colleagues who, who I think are on here. Uh, and I'm sure they're gonna, they're gonna tell me about it after this. So. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm delighted to share uh, just some of my thoughts, um, and I think if you can just go to the next slide, I can just run through them. Um, so, and you're welcome to just go to that next slide as well. Um, I, I think a lot of this, as I was thinking about this, is born out of the last year and a lot of the struggles that we've all been going through. Um, at the same time, I would tell you that as I sat down and thought about you know, 10, 10 lessons or thoughts, I had a lot more than 10. And um, so I just wanted to share with you the ones that really came to my mind. And, and I would also say that a lot of these are, are, are practicing. I am continually practicing th these every single day. Um, there certainly is uh, not, um, you know, haven't mastered any of these. Uh, so the learning process will continue and, and certainly the journey through the ELDP process and I'm actually working with a coach now for the past two years has been extremely helpful. So just to run into, into it, uh, number one, um, really, really critical. Are you in, on, or above the business? And what I mean by that is, you know, we so often get tactically stuck in the day-to-day -day, and certainly the pandemic has created that where everybody is doing a bit of everything. 
And when you're tactically stuck in the day-to-day, you're not thinking about the business and you're certainly not thinking about the long term of the business. So, you know, something, especially now for me moving into the CEO role, I have to extract myself out of being in the business all the time. But as all of you as leaders, you know, how are you spending your time? When do you have to be in it? When do you need to just be over it? And then really longer term thinking about it. That's a, that's a constant sort of balance and a constant struggle um, that is important to be aware of. Um, I know we've talked, number two, about empathy. Leading with empathy is critical. You know, it, it has been critical, certainly during the pandemic, but even more so um, as all of us are leaders, that, that empathy element is critical on a day-to-day. I was talking with a CEO, a mentor who's been leading a multi-million dollar company. And he said, Nick, your only responsibility is to lead with empathy. Um, All these other things are great, but if you don't lead with empathy, you will not be successful. And so, um, you know, just paying attention to your staff, paying attention to your coworkers, um, recognizing how they're feeling uh, is is critical. Uh, Number three, being grateful and and showing appreciation. Uh, I've recognized that even more. Being grateful really is about yourself how you're feeling about yourself, how you're going about your day, um, you know, but showing appreciation is that outward expression of it. So how are you showing an appreciation to your staff um, and taking a moment to stop and express that? I just did a, a video introduction to all staff where I had all of these sort of strategic thoughts I wanted to get out there. And I had to stop and say, you know what? That's not what I need to do right now. I just need to show appreciation and everything else will flow from that. So being grateful amongst yourself, but then showing that appreciation outwardly. Um, Breathing life into your people and inspiring. Um, I came from the background of the operations side. I did not come in on the animal side. And prior to this role or two roles prior, I was a CFO here in Oakland. So I naturally had that sort of pessimist or realist approach to my CEO who had been here for 37 years, who believed everything everything will be fine. I had to mentally switch as well, where uh, I needed to be a lot more optimistic. And that's something over the past year, year and a half, where I'm shifting my frame because people want to be inspired. They don't want to know what you can't do uh, or what can't be done or what the hurdles are. So that becomes really critical for, for all of us. The sense of creating a wholesome approach. At the end of the day, it's not about what you want or they want. Um, but there has to be this wholesomeness that it's got to be good for them. It's got to be good for you. And that's where you create sustainability in however we approach problems. There's always two sides to it, but how do we make it, make that pie a little bit bigger? Um, There are always options. Number six, um, I always struggle when people come to me and give me one option. And then I always have to ask them, well, like there are other ways of doing this. Um, Seems simple. Uh, but I often find leaders are not very good at coming with options to the table. So you, you as leaders are always asking, I'm always asking questions about, well, can we do it this way? Can we do it that way? Uh, but training leaders to think about options rather than digging their heels in to the preferred way that they want to get something done. Uh, number seven, thoughts are not facts and seeking to understand. Uh, I find this to be very interesting too. People develop these ideas or these um, perceptions and they believe that they're a fact and then they get entrenched in their in their mindset and we have to separate out you know how are you really feeling what are you thinking you know are, is that really true is that not true um, but that seeking to understand is critical something I try to do uh, a lot is I always ask questions uh, to the point where my staff know that I'm asking questions almost too too many questions but that seeking to understand becomes really critical and making people realize that they may have a thought, but is that truly, you know, is that truly a fact or is that just their perception? Um, finding your mentors, peer groups, and coaches. I mean, I think, look, that goes without saying, but it, it has been important. Obviously for me, going through the ELDP process was uh, really important. Uh, having a peer group, having some coaches, but I continued that uh, after ELDP. I have uh, a coach. I've got peer groups that are outside the industry. So in the San Francisco Bay Area, I get together uh, with other CEOs and other leaders. I find that to be extremely important. Uh, and then I, isolating and finding, you know, 
mentor, you know, not formally, but sort of informally talking to and learning from others. And, and then obviously, tremendously within the AZA community. But I encourage you to look outside of AZA as well uh, for those peer groups. Um, number nine, taking care of yourself. Again, listen, during the pandemic, that has been so critical for all of us. If you, we've, we've said it time and time again, and I think in a lot of these do advisor webinars as well, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. Um, I made that mistake. I had a, a meeting with one of my leaders the other day. I had an agenda printed out. I was ready to go. And then all of a sudden, this negative energy came my way. And I didn't even understand it. And I forgot to ask the question of, of very simply of how you're doing. Uh, and then I had 10 minutes of steam coming off, and then we closed it, and then we went through the agenda. But a very simple question of how you're doing, um, we're so entrenched on getting things done that we forget to ask. Uh, and then finally, obviously, staying positive. Um, again, I think we've all done that incredibly well uh, during the pandemic. It has been difficult, uh, but people around you want leaders who are positive, who are again uh, optimistic, who can breathe life into uh, you know what we're doing here at the zoo, uh, and it seems pretty straightforward. But you know, continuing to just show that positivity is really critical. So those are the first ten on my list. I had another ten, but that's for another time. Uh, and hopefully, I stuck to my eight minutes, Kathy. I appreciate it, and uh, I will pause. Excellent, Nick. Thank you so much. You stuck to your time and we're going to hold you to that to come back and share those next uh, comments. And speaking of comments, we are recording this. We will publish the recording and a recap. So uh, let's move right on to Sherry. Hey, Sherry, how you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, you asked me to say a little bit about my path to get here and I'm actually no longer there. I'm, I'm now at Woodland Park Zoo, not Oregon Zoo. Um, I came out of marketing and advertising before the zoo world. And then I was in the animal side and kind of shot through into the leadership um, role that I'm in now. And, and I love it. It's been a great path. So I think we can jump right in. And I can't tell you how many times we proofread these slides, <laughs> Sherry. I am so sorry. So oh, no, it's fine. I, all good. All right. This is a self-portrait taken while I was jumping on a trampoline. If you know me well, you know that fun is important to me. And you may be expecting that one of my tips will be never travel without a unicorn. And that may turn out to be true, uh, but I'm going to start with a story. So this photo was captured on December 12, 2020, the day after I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I received this surreal and terrible news in the afternoon. I made some frightened and tearful phone calls, and mostly I just didn't know what to feel or think. Uh, there wasn't much sleep that night, but by morning, I had a plan. And the plan was take things one day at a time, fight as hard as I can, and have as much fun as possible. And it was this commitment to fun that got me onto the trampoline that day for the photo and provided extremely valuable moments of joy that sustained me on this day and many days and weeks that followed. So my tip number one is fun is not optional. Receiving a cancer diagnosis is difficult and I got mine while also unemployed and interviewing for a new job. The good news is that the cancer was caught early and I got the job, yay. Uh, if you recall when the photo was taken, you can figure out that in the past three months, I've had surgery and radiation, started my new job and moved during a pandemic. No problem at all. Uh, resilience is critical and it's a skill that can be learned and built. Joy and gratitude, recognition of difficult times you've previously lived through, and practicing accepting uncertainty will all help you build resilience. You have survived 100% of your most difficult days. Use this knowledge to help you believe that you can handle your current challenge, whatever it may be. Tip number two, resilience is required. My survival over the past several months would not have been possible without love. From my partner, my family and friends, my ELDP family, which includes Nick, 
and the fabulous women in our zoo and aquarium com community all around the world. I know that talking about love may seem overly touchy-feely and you may already be dialing your HR person, but you must lead with love. Do everything in your power to make your zoo or aqua aquarium feel like a loving place, where the animals are cared for with love, where your staff feels loved and cared for, the guests feel cared for during their visit and sense the caring atmosphere for animals and staff. Even the people who live in the areas around the world where you do conservation work should feel cared for. Tip number three, lead with love. And then Kathy, if you can go to the next slide, please. And, and don't forget about yourself. You need to prioritize self-care and treat yourself in a loving way too. It seems more than somewhat ironic now, but during ELDP, when I was claiming I didn't have time to take care of myself, Tracy Smith asked me hypothetically whether I would take time out from work for chemotherapy if I had been diagnosed with cancer, if my life depended on it. Well, duh, of course. Her point was that my life does depend on prioritizing self-care and managing my stress, and so does yours. Figure out what you need to take care of yourself, commit to it, and enlist the support of others to make it possible. Tip number four, self-care is not optional and it doesn't have to be a solo sport. Okay, I'm gonna go a little faster now. Uh, tip number five, give yourself grace. This is a critical component to self-care. Forgive yourself when you're not perfect. Teach your inner voice to speak to you with kindness, respect, and love. You deserve it. Tip number six, give yourself credit. You know all those balls you keep in the air and those deadlines you meet? Those are miracles. Take time to be impressed with your remarkable self. You achieve astounding things. Give yourself credit for the frequent miracles you create. Tip number seven, listen. Positional power is real. Your words and actions will have more weight than you realize or intend. As the Dalai Lama says, when you talk, you're only repeating what you already know. But if you listen, you may learn something new. You can listen to yourself later. So while you're in the presence of your people, stay quiet and give them the space and confidence to voice their views. Hear what they think and need, and this will help you to care for them. Tip number eight, be curious. Keeping all of the balls in the air all the time is not actually possible. Since some will inevitably fall, you must learn which ones are rubber and which ones are glass. You will learn more and more quickly if you approach everything with curiosity. Curiosity is also helpful to keep you listening, referring back to tip number seven. Try using something like, tell me more about that, to keep both the conversation and the learning going. Tip number nine, remain calm. Asking tell me more about that can also help you to remain calm and receptive rather than reactive. If you have a passion and intensity gift, also known as a challenge, like me, this is very important, especially in light of positional power. Everyone has feelings and emotions, including you. Naming them, sharing them, making space for them will serve you and others well, but do so calmly. Otherwise, you may scare people. Tip number 10, gratitude, optimism, and hope. Spread this magical stuff everywhere. This is either self-explanatory or it requires a textbook, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And Kathy, if you can go to the next slide, I'll do a quick review and give a bonus tip. Um, so tip number one, have fun. Build resilience, lead with love, and make time for self-care. And these are up in the sky here because to me, they're much more than tips. They are required. Then if you have more energy, give yourself grace, give yourself credit, listen, be curious, remain calm, spread gratitude, optimism, and hope, and never travel without a unicorn. Thank you for listening to my ramblings. That's great. Thank you so much from the wonderful Woodland Park Zoo, Sherry. Thank you. On to, on to Becky, Great Plains. How are you doing today? Becky? 
my apologies. I thought I had that on mute. But um, I just want to say thank you again for having me here today. Um, I'm recent to Great Plains Zoo. I started here just about six months ago, but I was at the Roosevelt Park Zoo in Minot, North Dakota previous to this. And so at Roosevelt Park Zoo, I thought it was very important to learn a little bit about our namesake and Teddy Roosevelt. And so I wanted to start off with a quote that inspires me every day, which is do what you can with what you have where you are. Oftentimes we have challenges, limitations on our resources, and it's very easy to feel like you cannot accomplish what you want to accomplish. And I buck against that thought. If you are industrious and use some ingenuity, we can always accomplish our goals and overcome those limitations of resources. And when I was asked about this talk, I did confide in a friend and told her about it. And she said, you have to tell everybody you pick up the trash. And so I wanted to start off with that because if you know me and you walk around a zoo with me, I will stop consistently to pick up every little piece of litter I see along my way. And if a branch falls out of the tree, you will see me walking through the zoo carrying the branch because no matter what it is, if you see it, fix it, get it done, but your actions speak louder than your words. And I had found that my behavior led others to do the same. And so I did some major construction projects and suddenly the architects were picking up litter and the contractors were picking up litter and everybody would pick up litter and it just contributed to all of us just taking that attention to detail and caring about our zoo. Integrity and honesty. I cannot speak to this enough. Um, again, kind of what was already stated by Nick and Sherry is we do have positional power and people do look to us for inspiration and we have to build that organizational trust as well as camaraderie. And one important way to do that is to be honest, to be consistent, to be calm and to have your hold yourself to that high integrity. And then as it was stated already, gratitude, I think the attitude of gratitude cannot be stated enough. Um, when we are thankful, other people can see that um, emotion as well as they tend to start to feel more gratitude themselves. However, with that said, people will know if you're disingenuous with your thank yous. So you say thank you and mean it. If you are not thankful, don't say thank you. It will deteriorate that trust that you've been working hard to build. And then as it was also stated, have empathy for your staff. We talk about empathy for animals, we talk about animal welfare, but it is critical that we also address employee welfare. And I think that's one lesson that hopefully is a takeaway from COVID is work home life balance. It's important for all of us to make sure we are taking care of each other and ourselves. And then as it was also stated, surround yourself by others that you can learn from. I find that I seek out the people I admire and reach out to them. And sometimes it even takes a little bit of a leap of faith, just whether it's a cold email or a cold call and say, I think you have a story I wanna learn from. I have found more than not, people are willing to share their life experience. You can learn from their life experience. And as JFK said, leadership and learning are indispensable to one another. And so we have to be willing to learn our whole lives in order to grow. If you wanna to go to the next slide, please, Kathy. And then again, as it was stated, I think we all need to listen more. And that's beyond hearing. It's engaging in the conversation, asking those questions, and also being deliberate with the words that come out of your mouth after you've been listening, because we do have positional power. Our words do have weight. The higher your rank, the more responsibilities that are associated with your role, and the more weight that you have to your words. So listen more and think about what you're going to say. This next one has been critical for me in transferring over to this new zoo and acclimating with all the new information that I've been given every single day, and that's take notes and reflect. In our fast-paced environments, we are constantly hit with questions and decision-making and information, and it can be a little overwhelming. So I have found that it's so critical to take notes I sit down at the end of the day, I review my notes, I highlight things that are of importance, I circle things, I star things, I love check marks and making lists. And so I have found that it helps me to organize my thoughts as well as make sure I have that attention to the details to get the task done within a timely manner. But even beyond that, that retrospective time to think, 
allows you to maybe identify different opportunities or ideas or solutions that if we don't slow down to actually reflect on it, we may otherwise miss. And then you have to identify what's your BHAG. And if you haven't heard what a BHAG is, it's your big, hairy, audacious goal. I've had a lot of BHAGs in my life. Um, and you have to remember that they can be achievable. So you have to visualize that end result and then make sure that you take those steps to go forward to achieve that BHAG. I also feel like that it's very important that we make sure that you poke holes in your own goals so that you can kind of test it out and make sure that it can be achievable, identify your pitfalls, try to avoid them, as well as try to provide those solutions before you actually get to that problem. And so I think that's all critical thought and just making sure that you remain focused on your goal, but also make sure that you take those steps to achieve it. Write it down is another thing I'll say on that. Too often we are moving so fast, we forget to write things down, but it's been proven. We write down our goals, we're more likely to achieve them. And this one is kind of a lesson from fundraising. And that's no is not the worst thing to hear in the world. And I've heard a lot of no's. And I really have to say many times those no's are not now's. And so that's where we have to relationship build and continuously work with our potential donors and community stakeholders because as they see your passion for what you do, it can inspire them. I think it's important to look at it from their point of view and then make sure that you continue to build that relationship. So if they say no, keep talking to them, keep working with them, and those no's may turn into yeses. And then as it was stated before, take care of yourself so you can take care of others. I learned this quickly as a mom because I was ragged and didn't sleep and you have to take time to take care of yourself or you cannot take care of others. And so find out what that outlet is for you, whether it be exercise, meditation, a hobby. My husband knows that if I've had a really hard week at work, I am going to be cooking like a five course meal because for me, cooking helps me just relax, de-stress, and it also helps me work through some of the things in my mind just because it's a bit mindless for me when I'm cooking. And then lastly, you have to take time to have fun, as Sherry said, and see your zoo or aquarium through the eye of a child. That is our next generation. That is our future. And we have the opportunity every day to impart on them the value and appreciation of the natural world and environmental stewardship. And so it is critical to take that time to look at it from their point of view. And that might even be as simple as think about what the zoo looks like from three and a half feet tall. How many bars and cages are within their sight line as they're walking through your zoo? So it's, I found that very important as I do exhibit design, especially. And in having that tactile element so that you can encourage that natural curiosity of a child and then be a child yourself. I've been at other zoos and I'm going to say Akron Zoo with the otter, the slide that goes through the otter exhibit. I wanted to push kids out of the way to go down the slide. I held myself. I did not push any child out of the way. But make sure you have fun because we all do work hard, but we are in the business of inspiring people to appreciate the natural world. And we also can encourage people to have fun and make memories that last a lifetime at our zoo. And that is my little kiddo with his big eyeball staring back at you right now. So thank you again for this time. That's terrific, Becky. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I hear you with the cooking uh, as a stress reliever. Uh, that's exactly where I am. And I always think it's nice to have a stress reliever you can eat. So uh, <laughs> let's think about that. So let's move on. Thanks so much. Let's um, welcome Gary from the Aquarium of Niagara. Hey, Gary. Hi, Kathy. Thank you so much for including me with this today. Looking forward to sharing a few insights. Uh, and it's funny, uh, when Kathy reached out and asked for some participation, you know, the, the automatic response is, well, you can't say no to Kathy Wagner. So you know you have to somehow make it happen. But of course, uh, it's truly my professional privilege to work with everyone at Zoo Advisors. Uh, so I made the commitment to doing this and then realized, oh my gosh, we have to come up with uh, 10 points. And I thought who best to inform some of these points than the people who I've had the privilege of working with over my career. Uh, my background is as a marine mammal trainer and over the course of many years, made my way up into the CEO role, which is where I am today. So Kathy, if you want to flip the slide, I will get into some of the feedback that, that my staff has suggested. 
So the first one is to watch out for superhero syndrome. Leaders don't always need to save the day, have all the answers, or provide every solution. And sometimes stepping back can sometimes yield the most favorable outcomes. So it's easy for all of us, especially when we've done a lot of the jobs at our institutions that we're now leading, to quickly jump back in and try and take control and save the day. And what I've learned is that sometimes giving our team members the chance to troubleshoot on their own, to save the day and have their own moment in the sun is actually really valuable for their own professional development. The sound of silence, it can be difficult to let silence happen, especially when your career started as a marine mammal trainer. We are notorious for not being quiet at all, but it is important to give space for reflection and participation. I've learned a lot about what can be heard in the sound of silence when you give people the chance to to reflect on what you're discussing or even participate in the conversation if you're more introverted, that opportunity for silence and that, that portion of the conversation that can sometimes almost feel awkward when it's so quiet is really important. So the sound of silence is something that I've found value in. Today's weather and tomorrow's forecast, it's important to know your team's strengths, but also what threatens to throw them off course. So this has always reminded me of that scene from Titanic where they're at the very top and they're yelling out icebergs straight ahead. And I think as leaders, that's one of our, our charges and one of our responsibilities to be looking out at the horizon. It's always great to plan for those fair weather days and when things are going well. But I think that learning your team and having an individualized relationship with each of them allows you to watch out for the things that could potentially throw them off course and become threats to whatever undertaking you may be participating in. Kathy, if you can flip the slide. Getting your hands dirty. It's not always practical to be boots on the ground as you ascend into leadership, especially as the number of meetings on your schedule go up and the amount of time spent with the animals tends to go down. But there's real value in having a presence and showing interest. I I've seen from my own experience that the staff size will light up when you're taking the time to step in and get your hands dirty to participate in something that is core to what they feel is important or central to why they maybe chose to join the organization. And spending that time asking some insightful questions and letting the staff really show off is a great way of doing this. And it's a lot of fun for our PR team as well when we, when we have a chance to um, zip into a wetsuit, although it may not fit quite as well as it did a number of years ago, it's always a great time to get your hands dirty. Managing your mistakes, addressing mistakes does not need to be crisis management. It's more about taking responsibility and proper acknowledgement. I often say that mistakes are inevitable, they're going to happen, especially when we're taking calculated risks. But when those mistakes do happen, it's really all about how you handle it. Crisis management oftentimes is about trying to twist things into a way that sounds a little bit better. But I oftentimes find that there's real value in being honest and transparent about our mistakes and of course, giving proper acknowledgement. Coaching through conflict is really about staying out of the trenches. When team members or groups of individuals find themselves in a place of conflict, I think it's easy to try and hop in and understand the issue and pull apart the details and, and try and definite, delineate where there are lines where some people might have valid points where other points may be less valid. And what I have found is that it's much easier to stand on the side and help with coaching, trying to offer perspectives giving a lot of the feedback that so many of the other presenters today have shared, particularly with regards to empathy. So staying on the sidelines and providing that coaching rather than getting in and tearing apart that conflict can be a really useful way of, of moving in towards a more productive resolution. And then Kathy, we'll switch to that last slide. Freezing is different than staying frozen. Inevitably, something will cut you off course. It might be an employee who's valued and walks in and gives you their resignation and you didn't expect it or it might be a question from a visitor that you didn't expect to receive walking on the grounds, but it's really how you recover and what happens next that really matters. So taking the opportunity to acknowledge the fact that maybe you were caught off guard, but thinking about what happens next is really a valuable way of navigating through the unknown. It sometimes is tough to let loose and avoid dominance control when you ascend through the ranks of an organization. But a clear mission and vision should leave room for flexibility and freedom in the pursuit of tactical endeavor, endeavors. I say this as a really important way of interacting with all staff because if they feel like you're on top of them, micromanaging them, or providing too many strict parameters, you're in many ways going to prevent their creativity and you can oftentimes cut back on the, the ability for efficiencies and flexibility to take place. Probably one of the most common themes that I heard when I was asking staff for some feedback uh, on this presentation was that life is better when you're laughing. 
We can all make a blooper reel from embarrassing moments in our careers. So why not show humility and laugh when it happens? Uh, a few years ago, we were announcing uh, our, our new strategic plan and we were having a community event where that was being celebrated. And uh, during my remarks, I had welcomed our new newly elected mayor of the city of Niagara Falls and the word elected was distorted. And I'll let you speculate as to what word I may have said, um, but what's terribly embarrassing in front of our board, in front of our peers, um, but the way that you navigate through those protect, potentially uh, blunder-filled moments is, uh, says a lot about you as a leader. So laughing and, and moving on is, is really important, especially when those moments happen. And then lastly, ask before wielding the ax. It's easy to react abruptly in the heat of the moment and asking questions and employing empathy can go a very long way. So even when you're caught off guard, even when you're frustrated, it's important to slow down, give chance for the, the scenario to be fully investigated and to ask those questions because oftentimes a quick and abrupt outcome cannot necessarily yield the best results. So those are my 10 tips for leadership. Thank you, Kathy, for this opportunity. Thanks, Gary. I have a feeling maybe one of our next webinars might be on uh, the blooper reel. So thanks, uh, thanks for giving us that idea. I'm going to I welcome and <laughs> uh, yeah, self-effacing humor is great. So I'm going to welcome uh, my colleague, Lori Perkins. Lori. Thank you, Kathy. And um, uh, so before I start, I want to just apologize if I am not at the top of my game. I had my COVID vaccine number two yesterday afternoon and um, texted my boss this morning to say that I felt like I've been run over by a truck. Uh, uh, so it's uh, <laughs> not quite at the top of my game, but I'm excited to be a part of this and I, I didn't wanna miss this and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you. So, um, so yes, I'm the deputy director at the Birmingham Zoo. Um, my, uh, I, I won't go too much into my journey. I've, you know, sort of worked my way up through the, through the ranks in zoos. Um, and I'm very content at this um, at this level and at this institution. That's one of the things that we um, I was thinking about the ELDP program when uh, Nick and Kat and uh, Sherry were talking about that. It um, it often I think the program can show us what we don't want as well as what we do want. And um, and I love this role. This is the sweet spot. I think. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, Kathy, you can go to the next slide and um, I'll go through my 10 points. If I tip over somebody, please call 911. Um, so the first thing is actually something from the ELDP program and it's about being honest with your internal story. I think that it is really important to say out loud the things that you're that you're that you're saying inside your own head. I think it's really the most direct way to, to validate or to invalidate uh, what you're thinking, and to help clarify your words to others. I think almost every time I have said, "Oh my God, I was so afraid everybody thought I was an idiot," what I've actually heard is, "No, that's exactly what I was thinking too. I'm so glad that you said it out loud." Um, I think you have to learn to not be afraid to share what's inside. And I think it brings you to a, a place of more honesty as well. Um, I think that the, you have to remember to be selectively vulnerable, however, because there's always the risk of, of oversharing. Um, it's, it's important to be brave enough to show authentic vulnerability and to show that you're a real person. I think that's the fastest route to building trust, but I think going too far can have the opposite effect and cause people to lose faith in you. If what you're sharing aloud is, oh my God, I have no idea what to do. This is terrifying. What are we going to do? That might be accurate and it might um, show you to be an honest and vulnerable human being, but it also is likely to fill your team with the same fear that you're feeling and cause them to lose faith in you as a leader. So you don't need to spill everything. Um, and it's, it's about being authentic, I think. Um, this next one, number three, is has been certainly for me something that has been very tough to absorb. The fact that um, that nothing that that you do, nothing that anyone does, anyone else does, is because of you. We have all heard this a million times that you know I can't control what happens to me, but I can control how I respond to it. It's uh, certainly for me very much easier said than done. But if you don't keep that in mind, I think what you can find yourself doing is dancing around things and couching your language and steering your words based on what you think the reaction is going to be. 
And I think that is just a recipe for, for obfuscation and for lack of clarity. And what it leads to um, is uh, what I the lesson of, of point number four about using fewer words. I think anyone that knows me knows that this is one of my biggest downfalls. I am so busy oversharing and couching my language and, and using many, many syllables to deliver a message. Um, I, um, I should have said actually at the beginning of this, and again, sorry, I'm gonna blame the COVID vaccine. I'm not, I don't think I've learned all of these things. I think these are things that I continue to practice over and over and over again. Um, and I will keep doing that for my entire career. Um, I am not great at, as you can see, at stopping talking when it's time to stop talking, but I do think that it's an impulse that's important to try to control. I think the more that you try to clarify your point, sometimes you can be obscuring the point. So being concise and just saying what you need to say without fear of the reaction of what the reaction is gonna be can really uh, help minimize understandings and uh, misunderstandings and unnecessary drama. Um, point number five is one that um, I have stolen from our VP of development here at the Birmingham Zoo, because um, I think it's really, really critical. It's it, in addition to being real and authentic, I think this is really the other main way to build trust in your team. It's not about saying do this or do this please, ideally, but it's about saying do this and because if you do these other things will happen. Um, I think this is, uh, certainly for me, it's, I found it to be especially useful in asking for deadlines. I get much greater compliance uh, when I take the time to explain that the reason I need to hear from you by this certain time is because of these other things that are going to happen as a result of that. And I think it also, um, it's a very simple way of inviting people into the larger picture, um, giving them greater awareness and understanding of the role that they play in that bigger picture. And I think that's empowering. Um, it also allows me a, a legit reason to use more words. So it works out great. Um, give more than you ask. Um, so again, I will put the caveat out there that I don't know that I have always done a great job of this, but I think this is again about building trust. I, um, I think that if, if I show my team that I'm willing to shoulder my share of the load, it's gonna encourage them to perform well as well too. Um, I think that leadership needs to be about inspiring people to move forward, not driving them from the rear. Um, um, I think this has been a real challenge in this past year, um, in part because, or in large part, because I've been primarily working from home. Well, most of my teams are, are operational and have to be on site. And I think that I've probably lost some ground here um, and we'll have some work to do to make that up because I haven't shown them uh, what I think would be the, uh, the ideal form of leadership. Um, Apologize when you make a mistake. I, I think this is very simple and obvious. I think it's don't rationalize, don't blame, don't explain all the reasons why it really wasn't your fault. You just have to own it and move on. I think it's another place where using fewer words is important. Um, we all know how insincere it feels when somebody goes on and on and on with an apology and beating themselves up. I think you just say, you know what, I, I, I screwed up. This is the mistake I made. This is the consequence. And I'm really sorry for the impact that it had on you. And you get on with your day. Um, even if you're going to spend the next few sleepless nights roiling in guilt about it, um, it's still, it's simpler, it's better to just be straightforward about it. Um, trusting yourself. I think that that, you know, when I was sort of putting this together in a certain order, I was thinking that that, that roiling in guilt part is what makes me feel like I can trust my instincts, um, even if my instincts overdo it sometimes. When I feel guilty, it's usually for a reason. Um, even if it's not something that I need to be unendingly berating myself for, it's usually a reason. And by the same token, when I feel proud of myself, I also get to feel that. That's usually there for a reason too. I think trusting what your feelings are telling you, even against the any backdrop of self-doubt that you might have, um, can feel a little uncertain. But for me, it's been a really critical lesson um, in, in, to, uh, to be able to succeed in my role. Um, to uh, number nine is to be present and genuine. This one, that's what I put this cartoon up there for. It's like, what are you bringing me now? Um, the 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 biggest complaint that I have, I'm a I'm a, an inveterate introvert, and the biggest complaint I ever come home with at the end of the day is, oh my God, they don't stop communicating with me. There is so much communication. I it just never stops, and. Um, 
I, it can be really hard, certainly for me, um, to be able to face that next thing that walks in the door and put a smile on my face and and give them sincere attention. I would much rather just live in a bubble and sit in front of my computer and and do that. But I have also had experiences where not not in my uh, my current institution. Our team seems to be pretty good about this. But where you're trying to talk with someone and they're looking at their phone or they're on the computer or they're do, they're clearly not giving you their focus and their attention. And I think that, that that there's almost no easier way to disenfranchise people and to make them feel dismissed and not valued. So what I, uh, it, it, it is really hard. And I think even, I say, even when you don't wanna be, maybe especially when you don't want to be, because that's when you're at most at risk of showing that, showing the eye roll that you're feeling, but you're not supposed to be expressing. Um, and then Kathy, number 10, um, I think um, people who know me have seen this before. This is my mantra. This is, I, I should paint it on my office door. Um, actually, it is on the back of my office door. Um, I think that sometimes it's important to remember that leadership, you know, it, Leadership can be crap sometimes. We have to, you have to be careful about what you step in and where you step. Um, I think it's important to not take yourself too seriously. Those that shared um, uh, tips about having fun, I am 100% on board with you. And I think this is part of it. Don't, don't take it too seriously. Don't step in it. Now I'm gonna go take Tylenol. Lori, thank you so much. I hope you feel better. So here, so thank you so much. Let's move on to Carrie. Carrie Lewis from Oregon Coast. How are you doing, Carrie? Carrie? That's my first point is always unmute your, your Zoom which I do all the time, I apologize. Um, thank you, Kathy, for, for inviting me and um, I'll be mindful of the time. Um, Carrie Lewis, Oregon Coast Aquarium. I've been with this aquarium for over 20 years, um, but I started in marketing and communications, crisis communication and kind of worked my way up and um, the board um, saw something in me and, and asked me to take on as the leader of this wonderful organization. So I think I have the best job on the planet, I'm honored. Uh, to be here. So I have two slides. Um, the first slide, and I've been in this role, by the way, for just about 11 years. So I'm coming up on 11 years in it. So it's, it's, um, I'm learning every day. Uh, my first slide is more about the business side of, of leadership. And of course, you're going to, you're going to hear all of the, the common threads that we've all talked about. Um, and a lot of this I'm going to talk about comes from what we all had to experience last year with COVID because I learned a lot about myself and a lot about leadership last year. Um, so leading by example, obviously, is one of the most common principles of, of being a leader, but it's also the most important, I think. Um, if your team sees you picking up the trash or um, leading a, a group of school kids through, through, the, um, through the facility, they see that, they recognize that, they may not comment on it, but they really appreciate that. And so with that comes um, being kind and empathetic and, and letting people know that you, you're human, you go downstairs and you pick up trash. And right after we reopened after COVID, um, I was the first one on the floor to lead groups through our outside exhibits. Um, so it was a kind of an all hands on deck, but it was really important for me to, to do that. And it was a no brainer for me, but I think the staff was a little bit, um, they, it, they, really, they really liked seeing that. So I got out of my office, which was really important to do. Um, listen and learn. Uh, this is also another really common um, uh, attribute of a leader or, or, or any of us really. Um, you know, we, we, it's important to listen to your team, encourage feedback from everybody in your organizations. Um, great ideas come from anywhere. Um, we just had a, a separate admission annex built. We took it out of the lobby and, and did a separate building. And instead of me sitting at the table with the architects, I asked all of the admissions crew to come in and talk about design, talk about what they wanted. And they were just kind of 
shocked that they were included in this. And I just sat back. I didn't say a word. This is not my role. This is your role. What do you want? What are the tools that you need? And it really, it really um, empowered them, which I'm going to talk about in a minute about, you know, their, their opinions matter. And they're the ones that are going to be living in this and working in this building. So um, I just never stop learning from my staff. And it's really important for me to just step back and, and listen more. Um, communicate often and early. Obviously, um, COVID uh, took a lot of the things that we take for granted away from us. I couldn't do in-person staff meetings anymore. Um, that was very difficult. It was really important for me to communicate with my board and the staff and the volunteers on different ways um, frequently. And often the news was was not fun. It was difficult. Um, we didn't know if we were going to close permanently. I mean, there were there was just so much uncertainty. But the important thing was I sent out emails every single day. I called people. I checked in with my team. Um, it was it was really important. Now that we're kind of reopening, um, we're still not going to do in person meetings. But I still go down on the floor. I check with my team. I send out weekly emails. Even if I don't really have much to say, I'll, I'll just do something humorous or just let them know that I'm thinking about them and I'm still here and, and we're all in this, that quote, we're all in this together, um, which kind of makes me crazy, but it's true. Um, you know, it's, it's important to not over communicate. I agree, Lori. It's also important that um, to communicate as often as you can so there's not infrequent messaging and, and, and cross communication. So that's really important for my team and I think they appreciate that. Um, empowering, encouraging and, and um, engaging your staff. I mean, your staff is the greatest asset that we have. Um, I, I believe in the phrase of, you know, find the good and praise it in everyone. Um, you never know where your next superstar is gonna come from. So in 2020, we, uh, we took some, obviously we, we had to furlough most of our staff and lay off a lot of our, our people, but we're bringing them back. And we are focused this year on personal development. If people need help, if they want to, to um, do anything with improving the quality of their life, whether at work, at home, we're going to facilitate that. That's really important. Um, seeking the strengths in others. Um, you don't have to do everything. Um, last year taught us a lot about, you know, we're working with a smaller group. I entrusted my senior staff to do things that I would normally do. Um, and I was just so grateful that I just gave up my power to them because I can't do it all. You can't do it all. And really it empowers people when you when you find the strengths in them and you say, you do this, you can do this. I believe in you if you have questions, but let's see what you got. And um, we did it and we did it together. And I was blown away. I had our education manager and our marketing manager um, develop our whole reopening plan. And I was like, I'm, you guys do it. I got too much going on. And they came up with this amazing plan. So it's, it, was just, um, it was just wonderful for me to kind of step back and watch them grow. So that was really important. Um, next slide, Kathy. So this one is more about the personal side of management and what we can do to um, to be to be better managers on the personal side of things. We all know about the all the the details of of the business side of things, but. The first thing is um, is a quote that I've heard from Marianne Williamson: "You're playing small doesn't serve the world." Um, this to me is so important um, for me in my personal life as well as as my 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 professional life is, you know, during COVID, we all well I don't I had the tendency to kind of oh you know we we shrunk back into this world of what's going to happen and uncertainty and instead of instead of doing that instead of becoming more introverted I encouraged my staff I encouraged myself I encouraged my kids to keep going keep standing up keep talking and um, my father always gave me a, a quote that I'll never forget he would always walk by and say take up space you own it come on be out there and it really really is important to me to um to, to think about this quite a bit. Um, and and I, I can see when I do 
stand up and, and take on more. Um, my team respects that. Um, do things that make you uncomfortable. Um, this was a really good one for me because um, I think it's really important to push yourself, whether it's climbing a taller mountain or if it's speaking in front of thousands of people, do things that take you out of your comfort zone and push that envelope a little bit more. Um, what other people think of you is none of your business. Um, this was a tough one for me um, because, you know, I rose up through the ranks here and social media is awful and people post things all the time, whether they're visitors or whatever, and it's hard not to take things personally. It doesn't matter. This is their stuff. Um, so I think that's really important to remember. Um, balance, bonsai, and bamboo. This picture is, a. Um, I'm in Norway and uh, I almost fell off the mountain, but I didn't. And it's all about balance and it's finding your balance. Bonsai represents, um, represents beauty and equanimity and bamboo is, is just something that, um, bamboo just kind of thrives anywhere and can withstand the elements. So I think about those, those images a lot. And then the last one is remember your why. We touched on this earlier. Don't forget why you're in this business and why you do what you do. Uh, we make a difference in people's lives and in the animals and in the environment. And when you think you can't go another day, just remember that why we do what we do is so important. And this is a choice that we've all made. So, so I might so I'm seeing that things are going on here. So I'll stop there. You're good. You're good. I just wanted to, uh, Close now and, and thank the, the panel very much. Encourage those of you in the audience here to add your leadership thoughts via chat. Just please give us your one or two words. Um, and I'll, I'll end by sharing one thought with you. Um, a year ago when we were just kind of entering lockdown on the pandemic here on the East Coast in Philadelphia, I realized that I was not being a very happy person and I, I really am. I think I have a good sense of humor. I like to laugh, I love people, uh, but I was in pretty much of a funk for a while. And one day I heard, I'm a big Lucinda Williams fan. I don't know if any of you listen to Lucinda, she's a great, great singer songwriter. And I heard her song, Who Stole My Joy? And I thought, shoot, nobody stole my joy. I just kind of lost it myself. So I would encourage you to look for the joy in leadership, wherever you find joy, whether it's in mentoring other people, whether it's in a particular specific accomplishment. So look for the joy and keep up the great work that you all do. Uh, I wanna invite you to, again, add your thoughts in the chat room and please join us uh, in two weeks. We're talking about getting out of our comfort zone. A couple of weeks ago, um, we, had a session on diversity and design. Two weeks from now, we're gonna talk about technology as a guest engagement tool. So please join us then. And thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you to our amazing panel. Have a great week. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye now. Thank you.